Okay, so this week, Luke, right, we've been in the news. We've had a little bit of a, a press release about some work that we did with uh, our colleague Pascal out in Western Australia and the other colleagues in the UK at the University of Durham, where we apparently said something about the multiverse. So how about we do some sort of, sort of media-like interview <laughs> and you tell me a little bit about the work that we did. So let's start. Mm -hmm. This work is about the multiverse. Should we explain to our listeners what the multiverse is? I think we should, because it's an idea that uh, is pretty weird. So I spent most of Monday uh, watching the keyword multiverse on Twitter, and some pretty weird stuff came up. I've got to tell you, it's all over comic books. As a scientist, what we're interested in is there's a bit of the universe we can see, which basically is how far can light have traveled since the Big Bang, right? That's called our observable universe. And is that it? Is that all there is? And in particular, if it's not it, if there's more stuff outside, is it the same as what's here? Or are there different things? If I go far enough away, do I find a universe with, with you know, different electrons or something like that? So the multiverse is this hypothesis. Maybe if we could zoom way out on the universe, there would actually be different properties in different places. Okay, I'm going to interject here. Now, yeah. people like Max Tegmark, though, have written articles and pointed out that the multiverse is not some sort of single concept. There are oh, different yeah, ideas yeah. of what a multiverse could be, either regions of our own extended universe or even separate universes mm -hmm. very distinct from our own. Yeah, so I guess what unites them is, is one of the things that unites them is that they might be able to explain a particular mystery about our universe, which is that it, it appears to be fine-tuned for life. So if you take the basic properties of, of the stuff of the universe as we know it, you know, how heavy is an electron? How heavy is an up quark? How strongly do they interact with each other? If you take these numbers and you change them just a little bit, thinking, you know, why are they what they are? You know, why, why this particular value? Well, let's just change them a bit. You end up sort of ruining the universe, you know. Uh, the periodic table doesn't work. Chemistry doesn't work. The universe won't make structure. So the thought is, well, well, let's just create a cosmic lottery. Maybe we got the right value of the cosmological constant or the mass of the electron or these other numbers just because there's lots of other different universes out there in some sense, in, in one of these Tegmark-like senses. And, you know, if there's enough bits of the universe buying different tickets, then the right ticket's going to end up somewhere. Well, it's more likely than just one universe hitting the right numbers to start with. Now, um, I know we're going to come back to fine tune in another discussion mm -hmm. later on. Could you recommend any reading to our, oh, our yeah. listeners? Yeah, uh, there was a book called A Fortunate Universe, Life in a Finely Tuned Cosmos, oh, yeah, British, which, yes, British, yeah. Yeah, uh, by uh, G.F. Lewis and L.A. Barnes. Um, so we basically spent six chapters of that book just giving some great ideas how to ruin a universe by changing its, its constants and then trying to work out what all that means. What fun. What, what fun. fun. Now, but this research was not about all of the other, you know, the fundamental forces and the fundamental particles. This was about one property of the universe, this, this dark energy or cosmological constant. So maybe we should start by explaining what this stuff at least does, because we don't know what it is. Yeah, exactly. So uh, <laughs> the only reason you would call something dark energy is if you have no idea what it is. So we sort of know what it does gravitationally. So here's the story. We've known since the 1930s, 20s, that the universe is expanding. And what was discovered in sort of 1998 was that it, the rate of acceleration is, uh, sorry, the universe is actually accelerating. So look at a galaxy out there in the universe. We've known since the 30s that it's probably moving away from us. And what we found out more recently was it's moving away faster today than it was yesterday, which is a bit weird because... According to Einstein's theory of gravity, all the stuff we know about, matter and energy and the stuff the stars are made out of and all that, should make the expansion decelerate. That galaxy out there should be moving slower today than it was yesterday because gravity is always pulling in. And so the, the, uh, the discovery is going faster today than it was yesterday says that there's something in the universe that we didn't take into account of, something kind of weird, I mean, Einstein called the cosmological constant. We know that it causes the expansion of the universe to accelerate. And so it has to be unlike all of the other stuff that we're familiar with, stuff like you know, made out of electrons and quarks. So, so why do we think that the, the amount of dark energy in our universe is particularly low, or peculiarly low? So one of the things is, so what could be causing this acceleration? So we look around for some candidates. And there is a candidate within physics as we know it. 
uh, all of matter, when we describe it at its most fundamental level, when we, you know, you let particle physicists loose on it, they describe it in terms of quantum fields, something called quantum field theory. So there are these light sort of waves. There are these fields of the universe. And when they wave in a certain particular way, that looks like a particle. Uh, but there's a way to arrange that field so that there are no particles. And what that means in practice is stick a particle detector there and it will not go off. This is called the vacuum state. And if that state has still has energy associated with it, even though there's no particles, that would act like a cosmological constant, like a form of dark energy, would make the expansion of the universe accelerate. And so you think, okay, let's go to quantum field theory and let's try to uh, calculate how big we might expect this vacuum energy to be. And that number comes back as being pretty enormous. In fact, about... 10 to the power of 120 times larger than the actual observed value of dark energy. Okay. And so there's something weird going on around here. So this is this cosmological constant. We expect it from our theories to be 10 to the 120 or some huge amount more than mm -hmm. we actually see in our universe. And the question right. is why we have this minuscule amount. So what would happen to our universe if we did have a larger value of dark energy? Say like 10 to the 60 times more, what would have happened to the universe? Right, so a good way to think about this is there's a time that you can associate with a particular value of a cosmological constant. After that time, uh, the expansion of the universe is dominated by dark energy and so it accelerates. Um, the way that structure forms in our universe, anything interesting, interesting stuff, uh, is that it sort of gravity pulls it together. So you've got a lump here, it'll pull in a lump from over there, a lump from over here, and the lump gets bigger. And so you make uh, big things in the universe out of small things. After that time, when, cos when the cosmological constant, when dark energy takes over, that process basically stops because everything in the universe gets too far away from everything else. Okay. So that's the short story. So that amount of time, that when that time happens, then structure stops. In our universe, it's, it's sort of roughly about now, actually, which is kind of weird. Not sort of, you know, this particular Wednesday... Uh, midday, but around about uh, you know, 10 billion years into the history of the universe. Okay. Increase the value of the cosmological constant by a certain factor, and that time moves earlier. So it was 10 to the 60 times larger. Actually, it goes like the square root. So that time would go 10 to the 30 earlier into the history of the universe. So, so when, when would that be in seconds? In seconds. So the number of seconds in the history of the universe is roughly 10 to the 17. Okay. There's a number for everyone. Uh, and so it would be 10 to the minus 13 seconds into the history of the universe when structure stopped forming. Now, at and that that's point, bad, is it? That's bad because at that point, no structure had yet formed. Okay. And so nothing happened. So you basically end up with a picture where every proton in the universe is in isolated space. It never sees another proton in its entire life. Okay. So, I mean, the, the work that uh, you did, and I should say we did, yeah. um, we essentially asked the question, well, how big can you make this cosmological constant term um, and make it disastrous for the possibility of life occurring in the universe? So do you, want, do you want to explain just what it was? What did we do on a day-to-day -day basis? On a day-to-day -day basis, um, we continued to ask Jaime Salcedo at uh, Durham, please help us because our simulations aren't working. So that was basically the day-to-day -day thing. So here's the way you attack the, the problem uh, within sort of modern cosmology. How do galaxies form? Well, because gravity is bringing a whole heap of things in and it's pretty complicated, we try to solve that problem with a computer. So uh, break up the universe into sort of individual pieces, which represent a bit of the universe, and then in a computer teach those bits, program, so that they uh, feel the attractive force of gravity, they feel pressure when they get close, they form stars if they get dense enough, um, even the fact that those stars blow up and, and push things out into the universe. So this is, this is sort of a standard way that we attack the question of how structure form. So what we did was to take one of the best codes that does this thing by the Eagle collaboration and change the way that the universe expands in this way. Let's, let's instead of trying to simulate our universe, Let's go back to the start, take the cosmological constant dial and turn it up and then run that universe to see what would happen. Okay, that's cool. So, so you basically, when you wind up the cosmological constant term, you see that the um, ex accelerated expansion takes over earlier and mm -hmm. earlier. So what's the effect on the, the dark matter which pulls and the gas that pulls and 
the implication for stars. So what you actually start to see is for, as you turn it up a little bit, actually not that much happens. And the reason is star formation in our universe is slowing down as we speak. We're in that sort of period where things are slowing down, but without anything to do with the cosmological constant, it had a peak a couple of billion years ago and is now just sort of easing its sort of way off, but not because of the accelerated expansion, just because that was when most of the stuff was falling in and, and you know conditions were good. As you keep turning it up, however, you start to uh, make it so that this process by which um, dark matter comes together to form a halo and by which ordinary matter falls into that halo to then form a galaxy and stars start to be cut off. So we can actually go into our simulation and where in our universe two galaxies would feel attractive force come together and combine into one big galaxy, if we turned up the cosmological constant enough, before they hit each other, they got sort of pushed away by the expansion of the universe. Mm -hmm. And so that whole, an entire galaxy collision was avoided by this. And all of the, that might sound like destructive, but it's actually a creative force, all of the gas which would have combined and got dense and made stars, none of that happens. It just sits still boring in its existing galaxy. Okay, so, I mean, a lot of the press releases, um, the press stories on this had said about the implications for the multiverse. So, mm -hmm. so we found that we can wind the cosmological constant, dark energy, up by a factor of roughly... Oh, we did it up to 300. Yeah. Um, it, so we, we turned it up to 300 times larger than in our universe. And that had a, a, a major effect on stars, but not a totally catastrophic effect. Factors of even 10 or 100, but there's still stars around which was kind of interesting. And even, as I was saying, these smaller, you know, turning it up by a factor of 10 didn't do very much at all just because star formation in our universe is slowing down anyway. So what, what's the implications then for the multiverse? What, what, what have we learned? I mean, people sort of, sort of roll their eyes at the multiverse a little right. bit and say, how can you do any tests about right. this idea of the multiverse if there are universes you, have, you can never have contact with? Mm. We've sort of turned the problem around slightly here and we, we're saying, say what? So there is a circumstantial way of testing the multiverse. I mean, if you've got an idea about how the universe works, this is just science. You, you tell us what it is in enough precision that we can go and say, what would I expect to observe? And so what I should be able to do with that is at least some statistics about the universe. I should be able to, in my head, sort of go around to every universe in the multiverse with my clipboard and you know, knock on the door. And in most of them, no one answers because there's no one there and no one has ever been there. But if anyone answers, we can ask them, all right, what's your cosmological constant? And we could write that down. And then we could say, all right, um, what, you know, just like doing any survey, I'll make a histogram, right? How many people saw this value or this value, that value in, this, in these bins? And so we can do that in principle. And in particular, we have to know, which is what the simulation told us, if I knock on this universe, is there going to be anyone there? And so knowing that at least this universe makes stars gives us some way of saying, all right, that one probably has at least some observers. This one does, that one doesn't. So you can do that test, and what you'll get is a prediction for the cosmological constant. For any multiverse idea, you can ask, what would we expect to see? What will a typical life form when they get their act together and do some cosmology, what will they observe? What cosmological constant? So we did that. And um, if we just rely on the, the dark energy killing off the universe if it's too large, if we just rely on that fact with no other shenanigans, the prediction we get for the cosmological constant is about 50 times larger than what we actually see. And that was kind of the interesting thing. So if, suppose we, we turned the dial up from one, our universe, to two, and we totally ruined everything, right? No stars ever formed. Then we'd say, all right, we, I think we understand why we're here at one, because we, we couldn't really go too far anywhere else. We, we wouldn't expect to be very small on the scale, and if you know, we were above two, we'd ruin the universe. So that, that would be a good explanation. So what, we're, what we found was actually, no, two was fine, 10 was fine, 30, okay, starting to, to you know, get knocked off a bit, 100, 300, still not the disaster we see. And so actually this prediction doesn't quite 
explain the universe. Now we're doing an awful lot better than ten to the power of one hundred and twenty. Yeah. But fifty is still a bit big. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's it's still interesting that we we were at around this value of one. Yeah. But we could have been 50, 49, 47, and all these ones, and we still would have had some observers in those universes. Yeah. Except as we know, there's more physics that we need to worry about here. Mm. We have to worry about the fact that the galaxies we produce are somewhat smaller, mm. they're more compact, and so if you have supernova, these exploding stars in those galaxies, that could be detrimental for life. And, and I think that's possibly one of the next things that we need to look at, isn't it? Yeah, so there's a, there are a couple of ideas about uh, what we need to do next. So the problem is, we simulate the universe on a certain scale. And, for example, each particle in our simulation represents something like 100,000 masses of the sun. Now, given that a galaxy like ours is uh, a trillion of those, a trillion times as heavy as the sun, we're resolving a, a galaxy of our size with, you know, whatever that is, 10 to the 7 particles or something. So that's not bad. But if we want to say, where's life? It's not like we can look at one of these particles really closely. They're just a point. And so we need to worry about, all right, we, where, where would the life form in our universe? We can keep track of where the sort of the raw materials of life are because we know where supernovae went off. But we have to worry about things like, we, we learned this at a conference sort of last year, actually when a quasar fires up, when the, the central black hole in a galaxy fires up, it can be enormously destructive of the stuff around it. It can blast an atmosphere off a planet at 100 paces or whatever the distance was. We have to look it up. So those things we now have to start worrying about. Where in our simulations would we expect life to form? We have to do some thinking about what, what the consequences are of what we understand of astrobiology. Okay. Well, this topic of fine-tuning the multiverse is very interesting. I'm sure we'll come back to it. Mm -hmm. But before we sign off, do you want to give a shout-out to our collaborators who are also involved in this work? Yeah, so we were able to use the wonderful Code of the Eagle collaboration, which is based at Leiden and Durham. Uh, this is one of the sort of world-class uh, and a lot of very smart people putting an awful lot of effort into a supercomputer program. In particular, Richard Bauer and Jaime, Jaime Salcedo at Durham uh, did a wonderful... Uh, amount of work for us. There was a second paper involved which sort of took our universe and evolved it off into the future to see what would happen. We might talk about that. Um, and then there was us. I was at Sydney at the time. I'm now at Western Sydney. And uh, Pascal Alahi, who's at uh, University of Western Australia, um, who's just kind of the guru on, yes. <laughs> on simulations as far as we're concerned. So yeah, okay. uh, collaborative effort. So thank you for that. So, you know, uh, clearly cosmology is an international effort. So Luke Barnes, cosmologist, thank you and good night. <laughs> thank you.